1 Peter chapter 5, I'm going to read just one verse, though we'll be mentioning a number of scriptures. But in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, it says, But the God of all grace, right there is a message all by itself. Uh, what a gracious God we have. That is who He is. But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto His eternal glory by Christ Jesus. After that, ye have suffered a while. There was suffering going on then. There's been suffering going on the thousands of years since. And there's suffering going on today. He continues, make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, settle you. My question then is, are you settled? Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, thank you again for allowing us the privilege to come to this place and to worship you. I'm so grateful for the abilities that you've given a number of our folks that we can worship you with music. We can worship you with your word. But Lord, it's all because of your grace. We are yet in a troubled world, and we need your grace more than ever. And we will continue to be in this until you come again. But in the meantime, Father, I pray that you'll use these difficult times to make us perfect, to establish us, to strengthen us, to settle us. Father, speak to us tonight, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As already mentioned, and everyone already knows, we live in a very unsettled world. One which you can't hang your hat on anything or anyone. Nothing can be counted on. Not to change, or at best, it's very fluid, even in the best of times. Of course, the world and the people of the world, the unbelievers, have nothing in which to be grounded on. And that's why the world is so chaotic. They have nothing to settle themselves on, to ground themselves on. But if there's anyone in this world who should be settled, should be grounded, it's Christians. Because they're anchored to the rock of their salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet... How much chaos do we see in our own lives? And therefore, we need God's grace. And by God's grace, those he's called and saved, he did it to his eternal glory. That while we are in this broken world, that we as Christians, as it says here, will suffer for a while. Now, that's nothing compared to what our Lord did on the cross at Calvary for us. But it's still significant. But it's not without purpose. There isn't anything that our God doesn't do that's without purpose. We were created with a purpose. And even the chaos that goes on around us and the troubles and the trials and tribulations that we have, there's still purpose in them. And God will use them, and he's promised that to us. And it gives us hope and gives us challenge and gives us purpose, even during those difficult times. And he says that we will suffer for a while, and it'll make us perfect, and establish and strengthen and settle us. And we need to be settled. We need to be grounded, especially in these days. Even John, in John chapter 16 and verse 33, said that, there will be trials and tribulations, but Christ has overcome them. He has overcome the world. That should give us hope. That is why Christmas is that special thing. It's, it's a shame we have to share it with the world, we as Christians, because they've destroyed it. They've robbed it of what it was intended to be. That we can truly worship him for overcoming the trials and the tribulations of this world and giving us victory over death. I'm so thankful for what our God has done for us. But we still have to go on. 
And there is purpose in what we do. And that purpose, as I've already mentioned a couple times, to make us perfect, to make us complete, to mature us. What does that mean? To become more like Christ. To be more like the only begotten Son of our Heavenly Father. What a challenge in and of itself. Can we ever get there? Not in this life. But in the meantime, we need Him to use these difficult times to establish, strengthen, and settle us. And this evening, we're going to look on being settled. And that's why I simply titled this message, Are You Settled? It really is a very personal question. It applies to each and every one of us. But nevertheless, I think we sometimes need to think about these things. We have to get some things settled in our own hearts. Because Jesus has overcome the world, we can have peace and comfort and hope and joy and confidence, which are all conditions of the heart. It's not about feelings. Pastor Jason mentioned this morning about our faith is on an object. It's not a faith in a, I hope this is going to happen. And it's the same thing with what's going on here that we need to be grounded and settled on, is that it's not about feeling. It's about true objective things. And the first being, are you settled about scriptures? The word of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scriptures is given by inspiration of God and profitable for doctrine. Profitable for doctrine. What is right? For reproof. What is not right? For correction. How to get right? For instruction in righteousness. How to stay right? We need to be settled on those things. And they, too, are for a purpose. The Word of God is for a purpose. That man, the man of God can be perfected complete and matured, just like Peter said in our text. In Hebrews 13, 9, it says, Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines. Is that not a problem with Christianity today? Among the brethren. The world, push the world out of this, really. They do what they do because they don't know any better. But we as Christians, we do. We have the Word of God. We've got Scripture. We've got truth. And yet there are many so-called Christians that are not maturing, that are not being completed through the Scripture because it's not settled in their hearts. They think, well, this, this book is as good as the next, or the next one, or the next one, or the 80, 80 versions of the Bible that are out there today. Probably more than that. Be not carried about with divers and strange doctrines, for it is a good thing that the heart be established with grace, not with meats which have not profited them that have been corrupted therein, that the heart be established. It's essential that we get settled on the Scriptures. It is the only truth that we have in this world. And we need to settle ourselves on that whether you necessarily like it or enjoy it or agree with it. It's the truth. It's the Word of God. And let's see, as is often said, does that not settle it? We need to be settled about the Scriptures, the Word of God. That Word is settled in heaven, and it's settled in this world, and we need to let it settle in our hearts. We need to be settled in our hearts about the Savior. There are a lot of people who profess to be Christians that still think that you have to, there's more to being saved than just Jesus Christ. That it's about being religious or about doing good or being a better person than the other guy. There's a number of reasons. Or being related to someone that is a Christian. We need to understand and get settled on our Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. And we are to become like Him, become complete and mature, be established or made perfect. 
as it says in 2 Peter 3.18, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow in the grace and knowledge. Know the Savior. Know Him first personally as your Savior, and then get to know Him more intimately day by day through His Scripture. Settle it in your heart that you get to know Him in a greater way, and Christmas will take on a special connotation that it's never had before in your life. Even for us Christians, many times Christmas is still a time. It's not that it's bad, but gifts and food and many other things, and there's nothing wrong with those. And we give a half hour or an hour on Christmas Day for praying and singing, preaching about our Savior. But as we grow intimate with Him, as we grow in His grace and the knowledge of Him, everything is changed. We change. And He becomes enough for us. We have the only gift that we need. All the other gifts that are given to us at Christmas are unnecessary, for He's enough. We need to know about our Savior and have that settled in our hearts. He should be first, preeminent in our life. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, <clears throat> and He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning and the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. When our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, is settled in our heart, he is first in our lives. Are we not warned, as in the church at Ephesus, in how that they left their first love? And it's not that they weren't saved and that they didn't love the Lord. But where he was preeminent in their life, they got busy in many times, not just the things of the world, but things of ministry. Ministry is here to worship our God, and many times it becomes that one thing that moves him from that preeminent position to a secondary position. And he needs to, be, to remain preeminent in our lives, and we need to settle that in our hearts. We need to be settled in our hearts about the Holy Spirit. There are many people think many things about what the Holy Spirit is. He is a person. And He is alive in this world and within the believer. We're told in Romans 8 verse 9 that He indwells the believer. And because He indwells the believer, there is nothing that's not possible for us to do that God would have us to do. Because He is in us through His Holy Spirit. But yet, why to too many or often, how often do we not accomplish those things or maybe not even attempt to do the things that God has asked us and called us to do? We have the Holy Spirit of God. We've got Jesus himself that's working within us. We need to get that settled in our hearts because it's not a temporary thing. The Holy Spirit is alive eternally and therefore in us eternally. It's permanent. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit. We're secure. We're owned and identified by Him. But what do we do with it? I believe that if we get it settled, who the Holy Spirit is in our own lives, it is settled in our hearts, He can then accomplish in us and through us what only He can do then we also need to get settled things in our hearts about His second coming. There's also said a lot about that. We just can't wait till the Lord comes again. And we should. We're to be watching for that coming. But sometimes, I think we get a little selfish about it. I know I do. There are times I just say, Lord Jesus, I, I want you to come this moment. But I have two sons that aren't saved, other family members that aren't saved, dear friends that aren't saved, and I'm sure it's that way for every one of you here today. We look for His coming 
but we need to be busy about the Lord's business. But he, he is coming. It's a fact. It's already settled in heaven. That's going to happen. It's been prophesied, as Pastor Walker speaks frequently about. Jesus is coming again. We're told so, and for the sake of time, I'm not going to read all these scriptures, but we see it in 1 Thessalonians 5.2, speaks of it. Jude 14, 1 Corinthians 15.23, all of these speak of His again coming. But in James chapter 5, verse 8, he says, Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, amen to that. But at the same time, that we are to be patient and establish our hearts. We're to be grounded on this fact. But because of that fact, it should make us busy. We need to get busy about the Lord's work because He is coming. He's on His way at any moment, maybe before this night is out. And there's still someone that maybe God might run by you or in your family, even on the way home in your car, you might talk to someone in your family that made a profession of faith and realized they're not saved. We have whatever time, what moment that we're living in now could be our absolute last moment. And we need to share the Word of God, the Scriptures, because He is coming. We need to settle this in our heart. We also need to get settled about your home, your earthly home, where you live and who you live with. We need to see to it that everyone is saved. Now, we can't make people get saved. I got enough guns in my house. I could make a lot of people get saved. Would they, would, but would they really be saved? No. They would do it out of self-preservation and not out of faith in Jesus Christ. The Lord is not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance in 2 Peter 3.9. And if that's what the Lord, if that's the will of God, then that's our will or should be. We see a couple of examples of it, and I'll touch on them briefly, but we're all familiar with Lydia and her family in Acts 16 and verse 15, where it says, And when she was baptized in her, in her household, she besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. It was she and her household got saved and baptized. We see a similar thing just a little over in Acts 16.34, the Philippian jailer. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. And in verse 32... And they spake unto him the word of the Lord to all that were in the house. It was to the house. Everyone there in the home heard the word of God. And they got saved. And many times it's because of, uh, with the Philippian jailer in particular, and many other times when the house, the head of the household gets saved, those who respect the head of the household will get saved because they trust them. And unfortunately, in the world we live today, many times, our children don't trust their parents, and they remain unsaved. We need to see that everyone is saved in our home to the best of our ability. Not only share the gospel, but live the gospel. Too many times, it's easy for us to say what they need to do, but we need to show them what they need to do. We need to settle it in our own hearts that everyone in our homes gets saved. We need to see, settle it in our hearts that our house, our home is a spiritual home, literally and figuratively, in our house, in our human body, as well as our house and home that we live in needs to be built and founded on that good foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
so that everyone in our family will build upon that same foundation. What can we do about it? Well, first, let your children, let your household see you read the Bible regularly. Not just lay around, but actually see it. Do you pray regularly without ceasing, as it tells us in 1 Thessalonians 5.17? Do you go to church whenever the doors are open and get involved in church? Do you teach your children and family of the Lord by devotions, by practice, and where and when possible in formal training uh, in our home, in our churches, in our formal biblical institutions? We're taught that in Leviticus 10.11 and Proverbs 22.6. Do you live in your home like you talk in church? Many times we talk very spiritual in church, but when we get home, we talk like the world. Sometimes on our way from church, I must say that there was a time, and I regret, as a young Christian, I'll use that as my excuse, but it's no excuse. We were upset with something that went on and I don't remember what it was anymore, but it was petty. Nevertheless, my wife and I discussed it in the car with children in the back seat, how upset we were about whatever it was. The children hear those things. And what did they learn? Did they learn about the grace of God? Did they learn about respect for the word of God and the pastor and the leadership of the church? We were just like the world. But it was a lesson well learned, and it's a lesson that we need to keep in our minds, is let us live in our homes and in the world like we live in our church. Is it settled that your family is going to serve the Lord? I'm so pleased to see it. Envious in some ways, the Walker family, the whole family participating in uh, in the services, the Summers family participating in the services, and many of us might think, well, we don't have those abilities. Yeah, we may not, but we have other abilities that we can use that may not be up on the stage area, that might be seen in other aspects of this ministry. This building in and of itself is just a building, but it's where we meet to worship our God. And it takes a lot of work to maintain it and to keep it a place of worship that reflects as representatives, as ambassadors of Christ. And we need people. We need families. How much fun would it be if our whole family came and had a part of cleaning the sanctuary or helping in the kitchen? or helping prepare for Sunday school classes as a family activity, not just as an adult doing these things. The children need to participate, but they need to see us as adults first, that it's important enough to us to get involved, and they will get involved. I know, I believe this, I I could be wrong, we can't, uh, can't see the future, But I'm sure the Walker children, the the rest of their lives, they're going to be serving the Lord, whether mom and dad are around or not. Because that's what they've learned. I'm getting some looks. We'll move on. But we need to get it settled in our hearts about our homes in that the whole family serves the Lord. Joshua 24, 15, But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. There is no waffling there in this. We as parents need to be parents. And yeah, the kids will say, I don't want to do that. You made me. Yeah, but there's a reason for it. It's for their benefit. It's our job to do what's best for our children. And they learn not only by what we say, but by what we do. And then we learn and bring in, bring them in along with us. We must settle it in our hearts that we too will serve the Lord as a family and serve in sincerity. Is our service from the heart or is it out of duty or motivation by what 
people may want of us or think they should see in us? Have we put away our own gods in our own houses? We may not have a little wooden idol, though there are some Christians today that do have those things and think that's part of Christianity. It may not be some little wooden idol or golden idol, but there are many other things. Mine used to be a Harley Davidson. That was my God before I got saved. But you know, there are many times those things still become our gods. And like the church at Ephesus, we've left our first love. They become more important. We need to settle in our hearts about our homes and that our families serve the Lord with sincerity and let each and every one of us get personally involved. Sometimes it's difficult to let the children get involved in the activities that we have in a church because it's more work. It's well worth the effort to be patient and bring them along. Many times we push them aside and what have they learned? And then thirdly, and I'll not get through all of these that I have other than I might read through them, but we need to get settled about the house of God. And I'm afraid there are too many people and too many of the Lord's churches today that that is not settled in their hearts. We need to get it settled. Is your church the place God told you to be a part of? We don't rush anybody into joining First Baptist Church of Westminster. People need to decide whether this is the place they should be at or not. If it's not, where our feelings are not hurt other than that we've already fallen in love with them and they need to, and they and they'll move on, but I want them to move on to the church that God has for them. And it is not necessarily the church where mom goes to or their brother goes to or it's the music that they like. It's where God wants you to go. And how do I know this? Because when Susie and I were looking for a church, when I first got saved, we went to all kinds of churches because we didn't know any Baptists. And what we knew of Baptists, they were just Bible thumpers. Not that I knew what that meant because I didn't know any Baptists. But we finally went to a Baptist church. After all the others, we walked out the door and we looked at one another. We go, I'm still hungry. And I didn't even exactly know what that meant, but I remember saying those words. And then we went to Cheyenne Baptist Temple in Cheyenne, Wyoming. And the people were just as nice as everywhere else, but when the Word of God was being preached, the light bulb popped on with so many things I had been reading about. And my wife and I, we looked at one another, we go, this is the place. It was settled in our hearts. I got baptized there. She got baptized there a couple weeks later. And we served there, got in and served to the best of our ability until the Lord called us out uh, to our first ministry in Torrington, Wyoming, and ultimately here. Is this church the place where God would have you to serve? If it is, then serve. If it's not, you can ask why. If you like the music and you like the preaching and you like the people and you like all those things, then why are you not serving? Possibly God has you to serve somewhere else. And believe me, it's not easy for me to say this. I want to see this church grow. But I want us to grow spiritually. And there is a church then, there is a member of a church that's without a member, that is not being fully functional, just as there are probably a number of people in the Denver area that are supposed to be here. But because of music, because of family, and whatever else reasons, they're somewhere else, and we are missing members of our body, and we can't function as fully as we should. So we need to get that settled about the house of God. Is this church the place God told you to be a part of? If it's not, then find it. If it is, then serve there. Just keep in mind, as it tells us in Hebrews 10.25, I was talking to, I think, Eric about it today, that it's important. I do, and, and I, I'm thankful the ministry we have with our Zoom ministry, and I'm, I'm thankful as well that it, it's not being abused. There are only a handful of folks use it, and they need it. It's helpful to them. 
But too many people take it as that becomes their church. And it's not. Hebrews 10.25 says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a manner of some is. We must assemble together. It's a command of God, not a, a suggestion. Because we need one another. This is the body of Christ. And we need to function fully together. We can't buy everybody going on Zoom. And I've talked to a number of people. That's church to them. They give me the name of the church. I say, how often do you go? Well, I don't. I go online. Well, that's good. You don't have to serve. You don't have to give. And you can turn it off when you don't like something. And they, But they say, but I go to church. Uh, enough said. Settle in your heart as well about the matter of the ministry of your church, that it's always built on the rock, on the foundation, Jesus Christ. We do that here. And there are many churches, it's about activities. I won't name the church, some might be aware of it, but it's a big church. And I was told, I have not seen it firsthand, but I've heard it several occasions, they have a climbing wall in their children's class. And I said, well, what do they learn? They said, how to climb the wall. Well, I said that, well, I was thinking, what you're saying is make me want to climb walls. And I said, well, why are you not coming to a church like this? Which they said, we just love your church. Well, because that's where the kids want to go. Let our ministries be grounded on the rock of our salvation, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I am about out of time, so I'll just touch on a couple other things I'd like you to consider. Get settled in your heart that heaven is your home. Get that settled in your heart. This is not your home. And too many times we live like we're going to live here f forever. And it's that important to us. Our eternal home is what should be most important to us. And that one that we represent, our Father in heaven. That matter of our salvation must be settled in our hearts. In Philippians 3.20, reminds us of a very important thing about our heavenly home. Philippians 3.20 For our conversation is in heaven, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. That word conversation means citizenship. Our citizenship is in heaven. Once we look for the Savior, if we truly settled in our hearts about heaven, and that is our true home, then we will look for our Savior, and we will be busy in the meantime. We must have that assurance, and we must endure even when times are tough, because we can never lose our salvation. We can't lose our home, Jesus is building it now. But until it's necessary, until it's needed, we represent him and we need to be busy about that work. We need to get settled that heaven is our home and not this place. There are many other things that we need to get settled as Christians on, but really by what's been mentioned, if we get those settled, I think the others will take care of themselves. And I'll just end with the one word that I started, the one phrase that I started with. Are you settled? 